Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for watching that with us. Um, we've got a panel coming up shortly um, with Dr. Triva Gear, Vicky Weeks, and uh, Brianna McCorkle, our executive director at GCB. Um, I'll be moderating. My name is Abraham Park. Um, I'm the communications manager at GCB. Before we get started, though, I'd like to ask um, everybody who uh, came in, if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and um, make a quick change to your name. Uh, we had some technical difficulties. I do apologize about that. Um, yeah, we, we kind of messed it up a little bit on that aspect. So if you don't mind taking a couple seconds to uh, just quickly change your, um, your name on the Zoom, uh, basically what you'll do is if you go down to the, scroll down to the bottom, um, you can see participants, you can click on that. And once you click on that, you can scroll over your name. Um, if, you're, if your name says Alexis Greenblatt, it'll be Alexis Greenblatt and me in parentheses. And uh, essentially you click more and then you can rename yourself there. Um, once again, I do apologize about that. Um, that was our uh, oversight there. So um, please take a couple seconds to do that. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask our panelists, we're gonna have a short Q&A session at the end. Um, please feel free to send that over to uh, Miles Sager or uh, Alexis Greenblatt. Um, she's got GCV in front of her. Um, please send her a private message or Miles um, and they'll uh, let us know about your question. So um, with that having been said, I'd like to go ahead and um, give an opportunity for our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so Dr. Gear, why don't we start off with you? Well, good evening. I'm Dr. Treva Gear. Uh, I am a founder of Concerned Citizens of Cook County. I'm a, I'm a native of the, uh, of, the, of the area of Cook County, and I'm also a veteran and an educator, so, and actively working for the people for change. Uh, Vicki? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Vicki Weeks, and I am the Georgia State Coordinator for the Dogwood Alliance, and we work throughout the Southeast uh, Ma, to try to save forests. And uh, Ma, really, uh, our, our current impetus is on these pellet facilities, trying to stop them from turning our Southern forests into little bitty pellets to go send over to Europe. And Briante, if you don't mind. Hey everybody, it is Briante McCorkle. I am director here at Georgia Conservation Voters. I'm like, you know, holding back my pride for the team and, and all the people who came together to put this video together. I'm just really excited. We're able to help tell these stories about what's happening here in Georgia. So um, yeah, we, we do a lot of work to, to help lift up stories and, and do what we can to advance climate and environmental justice throughout the state. So thank y'all for being here. Great. Um, now that introductions are complete, uh, let's just jump straight in. Um, first question I'd like to present to you, you, Dr. Gear. So you're a founder of the Concerned Citizens of Cook County, and you mentioned that it really kind of began when you heard about the possibility of renewable biomass group coming into the city. Uh, can you tell us about how and why you got you and the four C's got started on the push to stop RBG? Um, after all, the argument in favor of RBG would be something about jobs and economic opportunity um, in ADEL. So can you go a little bit into that? Well, yes. Um, first, I'll tell you how we, we did begin by just meeting together to start kind of kind of do some issues mining to find out what the concerns were for our community and how we could make it better. And in that conversation, of course, the economy is always an issue. And, I, you know, we had a member who mentioned that, like I said, that there was a wood pellet plant coming. And that's when we became very concerned because having kind of have a, a sorted past with uh, the wood industry in our little town of Adel, in which it has not been good for us. So we began conversing over that. And it almost as if we, uh, ma our major focuses were mainly environmental because of all the pollution and things around us. So we knew we had to stop this plant it was not going to be what it was cooked up to be, that it would not bring us uh, the level of jobs that they said, because we want jobs that build, not those that kill us. So 
that and that's that was the core of our work and we began from there great um so as we understand it, uh, the plant itself isn't necessarily going to be burning the pellets, but producing them. Um, presumably, this is a better case scenario than actually burning it and polluting the area. However, there definitely seems to be some problems with creating pellets as well. Uh, Vicky, do you mind sharing uh, a little bit about why creating pellets and, and the whole uh, bringing in that kind of industry into Adel can be an issue? Well, in, in terms of this entire pellet uh, industry, it is, uh, it, and how it impacts the climate crisis in particular, um, the, you know, the industry likes to talk about that they, <clears throat> excuse me, are only using um, wood scraps um, and waste wood. The reality is that they are engaged in massive deforestation. So for example, Currently, um, uh, we're, uh, the plants that are in current operation are um, uh, costing us 43,200 acres a year. These new proposed plants down in uh, the Adel area, uh, plus an increase that's being requested from the Enviva group out of Waycross, is going to bring that up to over 110,000 acres of clear cut woods a year. There won't be a tree left standing in South Georgia. You know, these guys have these 75 mile radiuses and Waycross and Adel are only 67 miles apart. So, you know, you can see what that's going to look like. Um, in terms of why deforestation is a problem, we've got loss of the CO2 sequestration, right? Um, and then by the time these pellets are burned, they actually produce more CO2 at the smokestack than does coal because wood is so much less energy dense than coal is. So you've got, you've got those pieces in terms of the uh, deforestation issue. And when you look at where this is, the, uh, of all these plants, eight uh, existing uh, and proposed plants, five of them are in environmental justice communities. The industry also claims that this is a renewable energy source. The problem there is that it takes, as if you've ever tried to grow a tree, it takes a while for them to regrow. In this case, after they cut down these trees to turn them into pellets, it, it's going to take 40 to 50 years to grow trees big enough to sequester as much CO2 as um, the, the trees that they cut uh, would have sequestered for us. And then we've got all kinds of other ecosystem services, um, water and air filtration. In terms of water quality, when you clear cut these forests, it increases runoff, sedimentation, nutrient overloading. Um, we lose the storm protection that these forests are providing and uh, of course, there's that whole loss of habitat for literally thousands of creatures. It seems to be a pretty big problem um, for, for, you know, outside of communities. But we also kind of know that a lot of these uh, industries, they happen to go into generally areas that are overwhelmingly majority minority and low income. Um, Briante, do you mind going into a little bit about what kind of issues that might cause and what recourse, if there are any, for residents who have to deal with the long-term impacts of these problems? Yeah, so when we're talking about the biomass plant, I mean, Vicki just brought up a whole, you know, slew of issues. You know, one is the pollution and the air. Air quality is, is a major issue. It came up several times in the documentary. People have to breathe this air and, you know, children have asthma and in particular black children have higher asthma rates than any other race of children um, because of situations like this where polluting industries are put in their communities. Uh, typically, you know, uh, well, so yeah, because, of, so that's one way that it manifests. If we have um, the issues with water uh, pollution, water runoff that are, you know, caused from deforestation, um, that's gonna impact water quality. And people are concerned um, about making sure their drinking water is sound. There's all kinds of contaminants that could cause all kinds of health issues for people. And you combine 
air quality issues, with water quality issues, you have public health issues that manifest in, in cancers and, and diseases and illnesses that are, you know, people say are rare, but all these rare things sort of concentrate in the same communities. And so obviously something's causing it. I, I call it sort of a stacking of issues. It's not one thing that harms the health of the community by itself. It's sort of all the things stacked on top of each other that add up that cause um, these these deep problems. And if you're struggling with you know health issues, you know making sure that your kid can breathe, like you know it becomes much harder for you to be an advocate to stop those things, right? Because you're just trying to, as was pointed out in democracy um, in the the video, you're just trying to survive, right? You're just trying to make it through the day um, and finding that extra time to come out and protest the plant that was was there um, is really difficult. Um, and then I, I will say the other thing is that people find themselves sort of fighting things on the back end, um, you know, after it shows up. It's like, oh, you know, now now I see that this is happening. Now I have to 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 do all this work to fight it because there's just not a lot of transparency in how these projects come into communities, how they get permitted. Uh, they might, you know, bury a notice on like page eight of the newspaper that, you know, fewer and fewer people are reading. Um, so the community just isn't um, informed up front in a way that they can organize effectively to say, we don't want this. And so the, it comes, it shows up, um, it's putting all this air pollution and they're getting sick. And it just takes a while to make the connection between maybe it's got something to do with this, this plant down here, you know, so um it's it's a layering of issues in communities of color, you know, that make these things much dif much more difficult to overcome. Uh, another aspect of a community being environmental justice is also, you know, the fact that they're lower income, a high concentration of lower income people. You know, again, if you're if you're struggling for survival, um, you know, it is it's very difficult to spend any time doing other things, and these communities know that. And so they sort of, you know, that these industries know that. So they tend to target these communities and, and they say to themselves, well, there'll be less resistance from this community, right? And they sort of, uh, and then they'll, you know, feed a bunch of talking points to the elected officials about jobs, which we heard a thousand times, right? Oh, this is for jobs, right? And they sort of prey on that. Um, and then it gets, yeah, once the permit's there, once they start operating, like trying to get it shut down and cleaned up is, is is much harder and they know that so it you know it's get it in as fast as we can under the radar you know and then once it's up you know good luck community trying to fight it right that's sort of the mindset the industries have and it's really frustrating so you find this happening in communities of color all over the state all over the state um you know this is just one example but we have a, a whole map of all of these various um industries and uh, toxic waste sites you know and they very closely map with lower income communities and they very closely map with where uh, most of the black population in the state lives, right? So, you know, um, I feel like I'm rambling, but hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that kind of reminds me of, of Del Cook actually. Um, it's not necessarily the same thing where um, Del Cook comes in um, recently or is trying to come in recently. Del Cook's actually been there for a while, right, Dr. Gear? Um, Yes, As I understand it, it's been there for, for decades, um, yes. but could you give us a little bit more background information on Del Cook that we may not have heard of? Well, I think Del Cook was, has, has been in the community probably since like night, the 1950s. So it goes back, you know, way before people, before there were uh, different parts of the Clean Air Act, before people knew that this stuff was killing folks and that it just wasn't a good thing. And so it had been there, but it was a center of where many people in the community worked. Uh, and it was in the it was in the middle of the African American community, and there was another community on the back end of that near Warehouse, or no longer exists, but it was it was present there too. So it was just people all around these places. So uh, it goes back to that, and they, what they were doing, they were dipping these your electrical poles, they were dipping dipping them in a, com, uh, a chemical to actually prevent termites from eating them. And so um, so that was a big thing, and I know. If you, if you hear, if you probably talk more in depthly with Miss Althea Page, you know she talked about and Pastor Johnson about the 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 green machine they called it, where they dip these uh, the chemicals that would actually get on the people they were dipping uh, the the poles in. So 
is very dangerous chemicals that are still left there. And so that is kind of like what we're dealing with after the fact, because you wonder why this, this area is left abandoned. You got to know something's wrong with it. And, and then you start looking in the fact that, you know, I don't know if everybody knows, but those of us in the Concerned Citizens Group knew when we started sounding the alarm that, hey, uh, there's something needs to be done about this. This is still, there's still chemicals out here that have not been completely cleaned up that can affect the groundwater. And yet it's still here, it's been brought up, a uh, city council, all those people know that it's there, it's been there for years, but why would you leave this abandoned site? That's nothing great for your community, but they don't care and it doesn't matter to them. Um, Vicki, do you happen to have anything else you wanna add on uh, the whole problems of, of old uh, lumber yards, lumber mills? Um, you know, you touched briefly earlier about how deforestation can really devastate uh, local areas, um, devastate, um, you know, wildlife and, and all that. But do you have anything else that you can maybe add uh, about, you know, old, older lumber yards, lumber mills by any chance? Um, not so much that, but um, just a little bit about the, you know, in addition to the deforestation, the other issues are in the actual production and the transportation of these pellets um, and the storage. Um, uh, uh, pellet storage creates um, explosive flammable dust. It was the cause of actually a couple major fires, one down in Brunswick that burned for about a week. And um, there was a recent explosion uh, and fire at the Hazelhurst facility. And so this fine particulate matter that gets into the air is not just a problem um, uh, in, in terms of the health of the community, but actually has the potential to create major um, um, disasters. Um, and most of these small communities don't have the responses. You know, you don't have, uh, some of them have volunteer fire departments. You know, you don't have the, the capacity to really address the issues that are being uh, wrought on these communities. And that even goes to the healthcare. You know, when you see um, uh, the increased uh, respiratory illness, the cardiovascular emergency room, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kiro mentioned that, you know, there is no hospital in Adel, you know, so to try to go to that emergency room. Um, and then the 24 seven uh, noise and lights. I mean, it, it is just a nightmare being visited on these uh, communities that they think have no power to do anything to stop them. Um, yeah, that, you know, it's just, it's a nightmare waiting to happen, uh, it sounds like. Um, going back to Del Cook real quick. Um, so as I understand it, Del Cook's a brownfield site. Um, it, it's been abandoned uh, for, uh, I, I think, close to two decades now, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, that's almost that's that's correct it's almost been it's almost been two decades almost it, it's been it's been there for a while just kind of sitting there um you know polluted you know um i think uh in 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 our film um uh, miss page mentions uh that she wanted to uh inquire about building affordable housing i think um and you know they just turned that down right away because you know it's just, it's not fit for living um, this kind of reminds me of other places in the state, including around Atlanta, where, you know, communities have experienced pollution and environmental injustice before being left to fend for themselves, uh, probably because if we're being honest, they're filled with minorities and they're poor communities. Um, Briante, do you know if there's any recourse available to members of these communities? Is there anything that organizations like GCV or Dogwood Alliance uh, can do to help these communities? to help these communities if their elected leaders aren't taking action? Yeah, so I'm actually looking pretty, feeling pretty optimistic um, about some of the things that we're seeing coming from um, our federal leadership, um, our leaders in DC. Um, they have been working really hard on um, passing bills that provide additional resources for states and local communities to tackle some of the things, um, you know, uh, that have been long standing in, 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 uh, in communities. So 
We definitely saw things like the American Rescue Plan um, get passed. Um, and we also saw the Bipartisan Infrastructure Plan get passed. But the one that I'm most excited about is, um, and they're all bringing additional money down, I should say, um, lots of, of good money for things like um, lead uh, pipe replacement, clean water infrastructure, roads and bridges. Um, and I think what's really exciting and relevant here is um, there's a lot of funding for broadband, internet connectivity and access, which we know is, is definitely an issue um, in rural Georgia. And, and I think that's a problem. It's, it's an opportunity if people are more connected, that they're able to share information more quickly, to organize themselves more quickly. Um, you know, having that connectivity, I think really matters for people being able to come together and to, um, you know, organize effectively against these kinds of things. But um, in Build Back Better, which is something that has not yet passed, um, it is a big package um, to sort of reinvest in, in America in lots of different ways. And I, and I took some time to lift out some things that I thought would be really helpful for Adele. So one example um, in the Build Back Better Act is that first they'll put more funding across agencies to ensure there is effective and efficient review and public input on proposed um, major public projects. Um, so that doesn't sound super exciting, but it, it is really exciting because right now these agencies are very cash strapped. They don't have, um, they, a lot of people are just trying to get their jobs done. And that means that they're you know not doing the most robust effort to get community input. Um, to take that input and make sure that it's being considered um, and addressed in the planning of projects or the permitting of projects. Um, so giving more funding for agencies to be able to uh, more thoroughly do that type of public input uh, before they give a permit out is really helpful. Um, I know it kind of echoes an effort here in the state where they tried to some great late legislators tried to establish an EJ commission that would force all projects to get reviewed through this EJ commission. Well, of course, in our um, conservative legislature, that didn't get a lot of traction, which is unfortunate. Um, and so, you know, the federal funding coming from the Build Back Better Act would be a way to give these agencies more funding and incentivize them to do these types of more thorough reviews up front. Another thing that I thought was really interesting, specifically related to the biomass project, is the Build Back Better Act focuses a lot on um, clean energy and um, helping to accelerate the uh, transition to a renewable energy economy. Um, and so some of that, a lot of that is like tax incentives and things like that. But I, I do think that you know, as the U.S. does more investment in renewable energy, um, Georgia does more investment in renewable energy, um, that, you know, not only are we setting a sort of leadership example that other countries can start to, you know, also do the same thing, because I think a lot of people are looking to the U.S. like, all right, y'all, <laughs> we're doing it, y'all got to do it first, right? So, like, we, you know, we have to walk the walk, and you know, if we're leading on clean energy and making those investments, and if that encourages other countries to do the same thing, maybe Europe will find other ways to provide energy for their people than burning biomass plants or pellets, right? So we have to really like accelerate our transition to clean energy here in the state. And I'll just say that if we're doing that, we're also providing really good, high quality paying jobs. There was a comment earlier about, you know, the jobs thing, right? Like there, there's a lot of incentivizing these bad projects and in, in communities and they say it's because of jobs. Well, these clean energy jobs are higher quality, they pay more, um, you know, and so if we can continue to invest in the growth of that sector, right, you're, you're providing high quality employment and something that's renewable um, and beneficial to community, right? So, I would like to see, you know, those investments happen and maybe some of that, that, that clean energy tech or those clean energy jobs could potentially come to um, uh, ADEL, right? Um, people could take advantage of that instead of feeling like their only job opportunity is going to go work for something that's polluting or hurting the company, uh, their, their community. A uh, couple other things, um, there's a greenhouse gas reduction fund, um, which incentivizes not only clean energy, but energy efficiency projects. So, you know, um, I was just thinking, especially about that uh, Bitcoin mining facility, right? Like why, why is it so loud, right? They're using a ton of energy. So one, if they had more incentives to use renewable energy, you could get that energy 
from the sun, you know, like that's one thing that would help. The other thing that could help is with energy efficiency, efficient buildings. Um, you know, you could conceivably keep the tech, the technology within the facility cooler, right? Because that's why they're running the fans because it's hot. You know, if you have more efficient building, more efficient cooling systems, um, that could also help with that as well. And so the funding for for energy efficiency, greenhouse reductions is really relevant here. Um, I was just there's a couple more things. There's specific dollars for um, environmental justice communities um, to help them transition away from fossil fuel type activities. So Adel could conceivably get even more of a carve out. Um, you know, if they point out these sort of, you know, uh, you know, fossil fuel type, the biomass, the propane things that are happening. Um, Justice 40 is a commitment where 40% of all the money coming from Build Back Better goes into uh, uh, EJ communities. Um, and so that, that they specifically carve some of this funding out for that. Um, and yeah, there's also funding for, um, there's this idea to institute a tax on oil companies to fund cleanup of Superfund sites. So oil fossil fuel companies basically having to pay their fair share to clean up some of the sites that um, they helped to uh, produce, right? Superfund sites all over there. Uh, Georgia. So this is just a uh, scraping of the surface of all the things that are in that Build Back Better um, plan. Uh, it is currently moving. It's in the Senate. It's in front of our, our Senate um, that's got a lot going on. Um, and there was an update today that it might be um, split up into separate bills. But, but what's clear is that the way that America has been developing, has allowed development to happen um, in communities with, with energy is no longer um, sustainable. It's not, it's harming communities. That harm is being felt right now, both in, in actual pollution that communities are experiencing right now, as well as a changing climate. And we need to invest to redirect the direction that our country is headed in. And so, you know, uh, we're, we're gonna continue to follow the what's happening at the federal level and make sure that whatever comes out of that, it comes through the state of Georgia and that the communities who need it the most um, are aware that this is happening and that they know how to take advantage of the funds. There's, there's often lots of times where federal investment comes to the state and the only people that know about it are insider ballgame people um, and the community doesn't get an opportunity to take their, their bite of the apple. So we're, we're here to help uh, make that difference this time around and uh, making sure that communities know, okay, the money came from there, it's going to the state, this is how you get it, right? Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity there. Got it. Um, you mentioned Bitcoin, and I, I'd actually like to ask uh, Dr. Gear a little bit about uh, the Bitcoin mining facilities by Blockstream. Um, so basically, it's not necessarily like uh, Del Cook or uh, the potential renewable biomass group where they're coming in and polluting the, the area necessarily with like dust or chemicals or whatever it might be. But there is still a level of noise pollution, which is the problem. Um, now, it seems pretty clear that local leaders uh, in the city or county level aren't really doing anything to address the problems that families like the Tiburons are facing. Uh, what do you think might be stopping them? Money, profits over people all day long. It's the money. And uh, someone asked in the chat earlier where they reinvested the money. It was during the documentary. Was the money being reinvested back in the community? Well, no, because I figure if they were doing that, they probably would highlight it and put it on a big billboard and say, hey, we gave you know, 50% of the, or 10% of our, our profit to this particular action. Uh, while the citizens deal with high light bills, uh, it, and this it's ridiculous. So people have been complaining about high light bills forever. And then you have this Bitcoin mining facility using up, you know, 10 times the energy of the city. And it's, it's wasteful energy wise. It's just, it's just horrible. But then it's also the noise pollution is ridiculous because uh, you know, you're violating, you got city ordinances in place because what they did was they annexed a bunch of uh, county property into the city, which has let more lax ordinances on noise and different things like that are, are really are failing to act. And so you got this noise issue and the money, it's all about 
the money all day long. They don't care these people that people complain. They don't care about the Tiburons, Dr. Meredith, or any of the citizens out there because they're making so much money off of energy that it's ridiculous. When did um, ADO become an energy company? Right, <laughs> right. Really? I do also want to touch on advanced cylinder and tank. Um, as we saw in the film, the business is located in a residential area. Um, it's in the neighborhood. They've got people living right next door, you know, um, and there's there's problems with that, right? As we can, we can as we saw in, um, I believe Yolanda, who's uh, who is in a in our documentary, she's here today, uh, tonight. Um, and, and, you know, there's the issue of smell, but also, uh, you know, there were complaints uh, previously, I believe there's a, at least one complaint about um, them dumping their propane on site, um, if I recall correctly. Can you go into a little bit more about why having a business like Advanced Cylinder and Tank in that kind of neighborhood might be a major problem, Dr. Gear? Well, it's a major issue because you're really poisoning your people in plain sight. Uh, you have uh, propane being released in open air. Typically what happens because they're not always following protocol. Like, look how trashy the business looks. I'm just, I have to just say it. You know, you get it going across a railroad track. There's not even a, there's no business sign. Then there's no, there's no, there's no picket fences or anything that encloses the area to separate it from anything else. So you're just looking at this major eyesore, which is, uh, that tells you one thing, <clears throat> but then they were releasing the, the gas in the, into open air. And so within that uh, propane, uh, there's a, a chemical called ethyl mercaptan, which gives it the pungent, the, the skunkish, really pungent odor. So that, you know, it's, it's for um, leak detection, but releasing that into the air at the level they do, um, it's, it's dangerous to the community members. It's so toxic that you probably won't find that many studies on it because they don't really study it on people. It, uh, the, the studies you do find of when it has been accidentally released in a factory in a, in a foreign country. I know I read one study, but other than that, just studies on it because it's so toxic. So why is it that it smell, you can smell it all over town? Um, that, that is a problem. It's like a silent killer for all those people that live right there beside it. Um, what was it, Leanne McCormick, who was on the video, who was talking about her kidneys failing. You know, they didn't understand why, you know, that it was related. Well, that's one of the things that it will, it will attack is your, is your kidneys, your liver and other things. So, and it's a respiratory issue. Why can't I go outside and smell clean air? Like Yolanda said, you know, she doesn't keep, she doesn't allow her kid to go outside that often. Well, my mom can smell it at her house and it's like, shucks, half a mile, away uh, and you can still smell it so it, it's not good for the community I don't know who is you know I, I had a, a, a discussion with the owner one time in the city council meeting and he said that it would take jobs away from uh, people who can't drive to work because it's within walking distance and we were like flabbergasted by that response that you know it's, it's within walking distance people who ride bicycles and things like that but nevertheless it, it's not fruitful for the community. Um, some of their argument is that actually it's supposed to be commercial light industry is what that location is, commercial light industry. That means no strong smells can come from it. So what you have is your zoning uh, board, they're not following with the zoning because it's in violation of that zoning. It's also in violation of the nuisance ordinance for the state and for the, and for the local area. And it's not being enforced. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's a catastrophe and it's ridiculous. And so, right. yeah, so that, that's where we're, we're at. It, it does not belong there. Uh, they might argue that there used to be a, what, what they call a shirt factory. There was a factory there years and years ago, but I'm going to tell you what was back then can't be anymore. We can't do that in the community anymore. It, it has to change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think everybody here can kind of see a pattern, um, we're seeing these potentially hazardous or polluting facilities uh, that are either being placed at or near low-income communities or communities of color or being proposed to be constructed there. Um, I guess the question then is really, you know, what can ordinary people, ordinary families or groups or individuals do to protect themselves, to protect their communities? Um, Vicki, I'd like to start with you about that question. Thanks, Abraham. Um, 
Well, the first thing you can do from a, from a dogwood perspective is you can go to our website and we have a new blog up um, uh, uh, and, at dogwoodalliance.org. And we have a new blog up, uh, Georgia Forest Wanted More Dead Than Alive. And if you go in there, take a look at that blog, uh, it will give you an opportunity to sign our petition to the EPA. Um, I responded to someone in the chat um, who was asking about Senator Warnock and Senator Ossoff's uh, uh, engagement. And we, uh, Dr. Gear, myself, and uh, uh, some of the other folks who have been working on this issue um, have met with their staffs, had conversations, and we have asked them to support uh, the petition we have submitted to the EPA. Um, uh, through, uh, you saw Carrie Powell, who's with uh, the Environmental Integrity Project. She's the, uh, the attorney uh, who was um, helping us put together this petition. And the um, uh, petition is focused on the fact that the state of Georgia is regularly violating the clean, in this case, Clean Air Act rules, because they're considering these plants to be minor sources of pollution. However, in the Clean Air Act, with regard to this, these type of compounds, the state is required to allow the community to have a, a, a comment period, and they are not doing that. So, um, so we have asked them to support us in, in that petition to reach out to the EPA as we think this will really move the needle uh, for them to do that. Um, but one of the other things that um, people need to do is get involved at the local level themselves. You know, it's like we can have all these policy pieces and legislation and, you know, DC action and uh, Atlanta action, but so many of these, and, and uh, Dr. Gear can, can uh, validate this, so many of these start with the Local Economic Development Council. You know, if, before we get called in, because we don't usually hear about it until uh, um, uh, something comes up in the case of Adel, um, a um, uh, city council meeting where they were trying to rezone, and they rezone this property from agricultural to heavy industrial, like that. I mean, that's a big step, you know. And, uh, but, but the bottom line is this had been in the works and these guys had been lobbying the city commissioners and the economic development authority had been involved in, in you know, putting together the, the whole case for this well before uh, Dr. Deere found out about this uh, plant uh, coming in. And so, you know, people have to get involved at the city, go to your city council meetings, go to the economic development uh, council meetings, you run for office because we cannot wait. How long are we gonna continue to wait for them to do something about it? We right. are them that right. we've already seen what they are going to do about it. It's what are we going to do about it? So get involved. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, I think, I think everybody here agrees with that. Um, we've, I'd like to give an opportunity for Briante and Dr. Gear to also uh, chime in about, you know, what people can do. Um, but if you can do that within maybe let's say uh, 30 seconds or less, um, cause I'd like to give our, our uh, patient uh, audience a chance to ask some questions. So Briante, why don't we start with you? Of course, this is when my kid decides to bust in the room, right? It's when, it's right when I'm speaking. Okay, give me two seconds. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with everything that um, Vicki said, um, especially the piece about getting involved locally. I think one of the main things we are trying to do here at GCV is really redefine like what it means to be involved, you know, and especially what it means to be involved civically, like 
getting involved in your own backyard is one of the most powerful things that you can do. And you don't have to go to every council meeting. I mean, you don't have to go to everything. I mean, find a group of people who are really passionate and divide and conquer, you know, like if maybe you're really interested in transportation and your friend really cares about economic development, right? Like it's just the act of showing up, um, you know, and then continuing to show up and letting your interests guide you um, into how, you know, how deep you get and that's, I think is really, is really powerful. Um, so please engage locally and yeah, starting with a local county commission or local city, local city council meeting is a great place because then they start talking about things and you're like, wait, what? And then you want to learn way more about it and get involved. Um, you know, join groups like the Concerned Citizens of Cook County, right? Like there's always something that they need help with, like, but it's being local, I think is where most of the power, power has changed. And I just wanna reiterate the call uh, to, to step up for leadership positions. You know, Maybe they're not running for office. Yes, you should run for office. Absolutely, every single person on this call. Thank you for being here. You know, We need leaders at every level of government, um, but maybe you just wanna serve on a committee or something up front. That's fine too. Um, I think just getting in and rolling up your sleeves and, and engaging where you're interested is important, um, but keep engaging. Dr. Gear. I think you're muted. I would actually say, um, go out and get into a little bit of good trouble. Uh, our organization, um, getting, getting, getting with other people who have, who have those common issues, gather together, yes, form an organization, form your group, and uh, whatever it is, and y'all get together and you go and you start then making a demand on the elected officials that are supposed to be serving you. Uh, start putting people in different places. Uh, and that's what we started. We, we attend the city council meetings, starting to put people in our county commissioners meetings. We go out to the board of education meetings. We keep our, you know, we make sure we're talking to people so we know when we need to go up and show up for different issues. Uh, also find people who wanna run for office. We actually were able to uh, get Miss Vivian Sharp out of her seat because since, you know, <laughs> um, and so we did, we worked and we got a new, we got someone to replace her. One of our members, Ms. Celestine Hayes. And so she will be sitting in her seat and helping make those the, the right decisions and keeping us informed. And so that's what you do and you don't stop, don't, don't give up, be relentless and definitely reach out and partner with other organizations like Dogwood Alliance, like Walls, like GCV, who will uplift your cause and help support you and educate you as well, and Gipple. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for, for answering my questions. I wanna open this up for uh, some of our audience to ask some questions. I know we've got a couple of them already coming in. Um, from Pamela, uh, there is a question about the timeline. So uh, what are the timelines for the newly proposed wood pellet plant and what company is coming in? Um, so Dr. Gear, do you have, uh, could you answer that really quickly? Not, not quite sure about that timeline. That's the thing. Uh, we, you know, there was a permit submitted, air permit submitted, but no timeline for getting that work done. Um, and then the company was Renewable Biomass Group. Uh, I believe there's another company that potentially might be coming in. Do you know the name of that other company? Oh, okay. Uh, that one, I don't remember the name of that. I think it was Spectrum or something. Okay. I think uh, uh, that that one was called, oh, in terms of the Renewable Biomass Group, oh, their timelines, they should have already been constructing that, that uh, plant. But they're behind and they've been in violation of some of their memorandums of understanding because they have not met those timelines. And to our knowledge, they have not been renewed, but you know, that's what they tell us when we do the open records request, but that's, mm -hmm. they're behind on their job already. They're behind. Um, there's a question from Elaine. Um, she asks, uh, have y'all contacted Georgia Wand? Uh, have you contacted the Georgia Congress and Senate representatives? If so, what was the response? And three, have y'all tweeted and have attempted to establish a podcast or any other method to shine a light on what is going on in this part of Georgia. So uh, I think I might be best suited to answer that question or at least parts of that question. Um, for number one, have we contacted Georgia Wand? Um, I, I don't believe we have, um, at least from GCV's perspective. Um, 
I might be getting the acronym wrong um, and it's possible that we have. Uh, for number two, we definitely have reached out to the Ossoff and Warnock camps and asked them uh, about uh, if they wanted to, number one, take part in this, uh, this panel, actually. Um, unfortunately, they were a little busy right now, you know, being senators and all um, kind of busy right now. Um, but I, as I understand it, they're both uh, aware of this problem. They're, they're both interested in the problem, especially from what I've heard, um, Senator Ossoff is uh, particularly uh, invested in this. Um, and so we hope to get uh, more information off to both Senators Ossoff and Warnock um, about this issue. And then uh, for number three, uh, have you all tweeted and attempted to establish a podcast or any other method um, to shine a light on what is going on? Um, so primarily what we've been doing is we released this documentary last, uh, last Friday on the 14th. Um, it's on YouTube. So uh, if you're ever wanting to watch it again, please feel free to you know, look us up, Georgia Conservation Voters, and you can find it on our channel. Um, we have uh, had a podcast. We've also got a podcast um, with Georgia Conservation Voters, and we actually had uh, Dr. Gear on for our latest episode last week. So if you want to take a quick listen to that, you know, you can find us uh our, our website, gcvoters.org, or you can go to our uh, social media platforms. Uh, we're at GC Voters. Um, we've also got an education fund at GCV Ed Fund. So uh, please go ahead and uh, look into that. Um, in terms of other uh, media methods to shine a light on this issue, um, we uh, are looking into um, promoting our video, our uh, documentary through um, media festivals and the like. Um, and we've actually been getting some really positive uh, feedback. Um, there's also been a couple of uh, reporters who've been interested in writing stories about this as well. So we're gonna continue to do our work here. Uh, we're not finished, you know, this isn't, we're not done just because we got this out. We want to be a par part of the solution, not just a part of uh, amplifying the fact that there's a problem out there. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up on that. Um, there's uh, another question from uh, Pamela. She, she asks, people living in poverty uh, do indeed embrace these industries. How can this pattern be disrupted? Um, and I'll leave that up to uh, any of y'all who feel comfortable answering that question. Education. I, I would say being informed, knowing what you're really getting because uh, a dollar a day can mean death tomorrow. So making sure people know what what is going on and what is coming into their town because they might be able to make money today but 20 10 years down the line now i'm suffering with cancer and i have no health insurance and so what was the benefit in all of that mm -hmm. and it's also going back to that local economic development council i mean these are the people who are bringing these businesses in so you know one of the things we work on at dogwood is developing alternative economic development uh, programs and concepts. And, and, you know, when you look at the economic benefit of the tourism industry in uh, um, Georgia as, composed, as, as compared to the forestry industry, which is a big industry in Georgia, it, it generates far more revenue and, and has um, better paying and safer jobs. So, you know, the type of things that that should be being brought into these communities are not, you know, corporate boondoggles that throw together, you know, uh, jobs just so long as you build it, you know, and then then those jobs are gone because these these uh, plants are primarily run by computer, and higher level engineering staff is required. So it's again going back to paying attention at that local level and and ensuring that your, your representatives are bringing in the kind of businesses that you wanna see in your community. Um, I got a question from Danielle. Um, she asked, this is for you, Vicki. Uh, there are so many great things in Build Back Better, but the impression I get is that the US government has not rejected wood pellets as a green solution. Can you speak more on that briefly? Yeah, it's, it's a really a problem. Um, if uh, you, some of you may recall the infamous Scott Pruitt, who was uh, the EPA administrator, um, and he came to Georgia to announce that the EPA was um, uh, um, officially designating 
biomass as carbon neutral, despite the findings of his own scientists in uh, the EPA. So uh, it is a problem. The reason they wanted that designation is because then as a renewable energy source, it can qualify for um, uh, incentives that are geared toward renewable energy. And so it is one of the things in Savannah and uh, Atlanta, but Savannah is a good example because they specifically in their clean energy plan um, that was passed in the city uh, to their credit by 100% uh, of the city uh, commissioners, that uh, plan specifically does not allow biomass to be considered a clean renewable energy source. Got it. So, um, so I do want to uh, take note of the time. We're a couple minutes over the 7.30 um, time limit to uh, complete our time here. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Dr. Gear, Vicki Weeks. I want to thank you, Briante. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to uh, Alexis and Miles in the background. I want to give a shout out to everybody who is a part of this, including Dr. Parr, who I saw, and, and Yolanda as well. Uh, I know there's more questions. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but if you want to, you can please you can go ahead and email me at abraham at gcvoters. Dot org, and I will do my best to get those questions answered for you. Um, if you guys have any other questions or you know anything else you guys want to talk about, please feel free to message me as well uh, on that email. Thank you all once more so much for coming out. Um, please check out our website. Please check out Dogwood Alliance, and please check out Concerned Citizens of Cook County. Um, have a good night.